Thus be, always be mindful of them, but never live in expectation of them. Rather, view the world as it is, and trust in your own powers of observation and judgment. And know this, the greatest truths are, by necessity, simple. When they do appear, they touch us with a new sense of clarity and direction. Wait and observe patiently. In time, they will appear. But also know this, if they are not what you expect to see, you will not recognize them. Hello, I'm Marshall Masters, publisher of Yowza.com, that's Y-O-W-U-S-A.com, and the author of Planet X Forecast and 2012 Survival Guide and Crossing the Cusp, Surviving the Edgar Cayce Pole Shift. When we think about December 21, 2012, we're thinking about a day that has a tremendous amount of prophecy, secular and non-secular, converging upon it. So what does that mean for us? Like the pieces of a large picture puzzle, all of this prophecy comes from a vast array of sources, biblical, folklore, prophecy, and prediction. And though we devote great energy to sorting it all out, doesn't it always seem as though we're missing a few pieces? And the worst of it is that many of these missing pieces have not been mislaid or forgotten. Rather, they've been hidden, obfuscated, or trivialized so as to prevent us from seeing the whole picture with perfect clarity. So we debate and argue, leaving many just to throw up their hands and walk away. So in essence, what we're all searching for is that one prediction that covers all the bases, from the Alpha to the Omega. The one that tells us what we're going to see, when we're going to see it, where we're going to see it, and what it's going to mean for us. Nonetheless, the partial picture of prophecies and predictions we now have warn us that the worst is yet to come. Catastrophic events that will surely bring life as we know it to an end. But is there one prediction with a complete picture of exactly what will happen? Yes, there is. And it was delivered to us in two parts during the month of July 2008. And I call it the 2012 Star Map of Doom. Nearly the size of four soccer fields, this two-part message in the Avebury 2008 crop circle formation comes from an intelligence other than our own. It is quite clear about what we'll see and when we'll see it. It also tells us where we'll see it and what the consequences of that shall mean for us. This is because it gives us a highly detailed prediction about an object known to the ancients one they called by many names to include Nibiru, Destroyer, Hercobolus, and the Red Comet, just to name a few. However, before we can explore this prediction, we must first vet the source, that being this 2008 crop circle formation. This is a crucial first step because this formation goes beyond offering a precise and rather dire prediction for our time and of a global catastrophe that will principally unfold in the years 2013 and 2014. And if this prediction comes to pass, it will also send us another clear and unequivocal message that we've never been nor ever shall be alone, that we have friends out there and that we may have enemies as well. Keep this third part firmly in mind because we'll revisit it later on in the program. But for now, suffice it to say 
that these potential enemies could be looking down upon us no differently than we would a farm-raised trout. That being that we humans are just another biodiversity resource to be managed and exploited. With all this in mind, you might be wondering, where did this all start for me? Well, it began with an anonymous tip, an email that arrived in my email box, and the minute I set eyes on it, I knew it was something important and that I needed to take immediate action. So I did. Thanks to that tip, I was able to capture a web page image from the complete Avebury formation on the Crop Circle Connector site, less than one hour before it disappeared without a trace. Just as my anonymous tipster had warned, the page and all of the graphics associated with it just vanished. Mark Fusel and Stuart Dyke published Crop Circle Connector, and it is what I call a benchmark site. There are a lot of wonderful, wonderful crop circle sites on the internet, but a benchmark site is the one that you use to measure them with. That's Crop Circle Connector for me, and it's why I always go there first when I'm doing my research. So, given this mm, strange disappearance, I knew that there was something afoot. Something researchers like myself see happen time and again. We simply say, the telephone rang. And when it does, trust me, it's not going to be dialing for dollars. This prompted me to post an article on the 26th of that month titled, Are Governments Suppressing the 23 July 08 Planet X Nibiru Crop Circle in Avebury? My goal was simple. I wanted to call attention to this mysterious and sudden disappearance. And sure enough, 10 days later, the page reappeared on the Crop Circle Connector site. To this day, neither Mark Fusel nor Stuart Dyke of the Crop Circle Connector site have ever refuted my public claim that they had come under pressure to pull their page. So what's to be made of that? Well, these things just happen. And when they do, you've got to move through it. Besides, all this interference has its upside as well. A cover-up tells you that you're on to something. In this case, the existence of a cover-up says two things. The first of which is that the Avebury 2008 formation was indeed authentic. That being, it was not man-made. In which event, we must ask, is authenticity alone sufficient reason to warrant a cover-up effort? Well, of course not. This is because it is also obvious that the Avebury 2008 formation was like a cosmic message in a bottle. It washed up on the farmland of England with an urgent message to us for these times that if you are standing in the fields of Avebury, England on December 21, 2012, look at the setting sun and then 45 degrees right, 45 degrees up, and there you go. You'll know the worst is to come in 2013 and 2014. This is because when we see this object on December 21, 2012, it will be at its point of perihelion, that point in its 3600-year orbit where it comes closest to the Sun. At this time, it will begin its transit of what I call the kill zone for Earth. The kill zone ranges from between the object's point of perihelion and the point at which its orbit crosses the ecliptic, the plane of our solar system. While it will never strike our planet, the electrical interactions between this object and our Sun during this kill zone transit will be fearsome, like nothing we've ever seen before. Ergo, if this prediction comes to pass, January 31, 2012 will be the last time we see the ball drop in Times Square and for many years to come, if ever again. 
All of this is carefully and methodically explained in my book, Crossing the Cusp, Surviving the Edgar Cayce Pole Shift. The first third of the book is principally devoted to a step-by-step -step decoding of the message in this formation. Now let's take a look at a few of those illustrations to see what I mean. The first part of the formation was reported on the 15th of July, 2008. Note that the major planets in our system are perfectly aligned to the date of December 21, 2012. Therefore, the first part of this formation serves as a date stamp for the purpose of this prediction. The when, if you will. The what is revealed in the second part of the formation. Reported on the 22nd of July, 2008, the second part of the formation tells us that we will see what appears to be two suns in the sky, and that after that, our planet will be hammered by brutally catastrophic solar storms. Also consider this. Though both parts of this formation appear days apart, they nonetheless overlay each other with absolute surgical precision and together both parts reveal a crop circle formation that is nearly the size of four soccer fields. Now that's big. So if the crop circle makers needed to create a formation this large, then we have to ask the question, how bad could it be for us? The film Knowing, a 2009 blockbuster, is famous for the last scene in which we see the end of life on the surface of our planet. The movie closes with a very dramatic graphic in which we see a solar storm devastating the surface of the Earth. But I think there's another graphic used in the film that's going to be a lot more useful to us in terms of this dialogue. In the film, Jonathan, the character played by Nicolas Cage, is a professor of astrophysics at MIT. He uses a comparative animation to confirm his fears that an impending catastrophic solar storm is about to devastate the Earth. So if the Avebury 2008 prediction comes true, this animation pretty much sizes up what we could be looking at. And there could be other consequences as well. The Val Marineris on Mars cuts a 4,000 kilometer long gash on the surface of the planet. Comparing it with our own Grand Canyon would be unfair. With a total length of 446 kilometers, our own Grand Canyon ranks a very distant second place. So how did it get there? River water? Or was it simply a matter of being at the wrong place and at the wrong time. That's why when the stakes are as high as those shown by the Avebury formation, what we really need is to make an informed decision using boots on the ground intelligence. Yes, it was time to revisit Avebury 2008 with a boots on the ground look at it. But like many others, I've yet to experience the pleasure of walking in a new formation such as this. Fortunately for us, that boots on the ground information is available in ample supply because Avebury 2008 was the big event of that year. So I sought out those who had actually walked the formation, crop circle enthusiasts or croppies as they call themselves and crop circle documentary producers. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to interview several people who have walked that formation. But the two that really stood out for me were Suzanne Taylor and Patty Greer. Both of them are documentary producers. Both of them featured Avebury 2008 in their videos. Here they are, they're excellent videos. And lucky for me, both of these incredibly talented women agreed to be interviewed on my show, Cut to the Chase. Patty appeared on Cut to the Chase in June 2009 to discuss her video, 2012, We're Already In It, which features the Avebury 2008 formation. 
I have found that there's two basic ways to look at crop circles, intellect and experience. And when it comes to conveying a sense of experience to the viewer, this is where Patty Greer sets the mark. This is because her video, 2012, we're already in it, is the closest way to experiencing a crop circle formation without ever having set foot in one. It is why this video remains an enduring favorite of those who've just begun to explore this ancient and magnificent phenomena. However, after our interview, Patty told me about something she had not included in her video. Shortly after the first part of the formation had been reported on July 15, 2008, Patty chartered an ultralight aircraft for an overflight. It's lucky for us that she kept a copy of that outtake footage because she sent me a copy of her flyover video. So now you're going to see this exclusive footage for the first time ever as we listen to a few snippets of my interview with Patty Greer when she was on Cut to the Chase and as she describes this formation. I am a true crappie. I go in the formations every morning, first thing, crack of dawn, with the other people with dirty knees and muddy shoes. There's a variety of different people in the crop circles, but considering how big the world is, I can't believe how few of us there are. And the particular formation that you were so drawn to, I called it the Avebury Manor. Uh, it sits in a beautiful field, and when it came down, yay, it was one of the days I was flying uh, in a little microlight plane, and I had my movie camera and my still camera, and so I've got tons of shots of the formation, which if you need it, and your formation that you loved, I was in a number of times, and one of them is my, what I call the eerie time, it was at sunset, and I had gone in it early in the day, the day it was born, the day that they announced, oh my God, there's a huge one in the Avebury Manor. So those of us that meet early in the morning at the Silent Circle, which is the crop circle secret in the middle of this English area where they're all coming down, we kind of whisper to each other where they are, what gate you climb over, how many tram lines to the left or right, which are trailer track, tractor lines. And that's how you find your way into the formation. It is really hard to find them unless you're flying. The night that it, that it came down, we woke up the next morning and a lot of people were coming in. The farmer didn't want people to enjoy it, so he took his, his big tractor and he mowed two huge um, down lines right through the center of the formation. So flying over it, all of a sudden, it was not as pretty or as perfect. And there were plants missing. So there were these two big white lines on this gorgeous painting the very next morning. Anyway, the interesting thing is that a few days later, maybe it was a week on this one, the circle makers came back and nailed the rest of the Avery Manor field with the biggest formation, maybe of the summer, it took up acres. And this thing took an hour to walk, and you still couldn't see it all. And from the air, when I look at them from the air, the few of them that are man-made, they look pretty shabby. The ones that are absolutely meticulous, the people are making them, those people are gifted. I think a lot of them are definitely not man-made. And what came down in that field from the air, I went, oh, damn, some kids came in, because it didn't look very perfect. But then I went into it that day, and it was out of this world. It was unbelievable inside. There was the moon and the sun and the comets. There was every single shaping of a planetary system and you could tell when you were in it on the ground. During my conversations with Patty, she also disclosed to me that during this overflight of the formation, her ultralight pilot refused to fly directly over the formation because he was afraid that it would affect the instrumentation on his craft. Now this is a common problem with authentic formation. Hoax formations do not interfere with aircraft instrumentation. I think that's important to keep in mind. Now let's move on to our next person, Suzanne Taylor. Like Patty, she too is a talented documentary producer and a dedicated boots-on-the-ground crop circle researcher. 
where Patty gives us a sense of experience, Suzanne Taylor has a unique gift for painting a big picture story of crop circles on an intellectual level. This is important because she presents information that is intentionally withheld from the public by mainstream sources such as National Geographic, which is now viewed by most croppies in England as an elitist propaganda mill when it comes to crop circles. For example, did you know that authentic formations have been observed by numerous people as they are formed? And surprisingly, it only takes about eight seconds, according to Suzanne and Patty, who both tell us that this has been a phenomena witnessed by many. A documented fact the mainstream media refuses to report. I interviewed Suzanne in January 2010 on my Cut to the Chase show. During that interview, we focused on her criteria for judging a crop circle to be authentic. In other words, one that is not man-made. So now let's listen to an excerpt of Susan's interview on Cut to the Chase as we look at a few of the clips from her documentary. The question I would have to you is that we talked about this era of authenticity issue on Crabwood 2002. Are you hearing these same kind of authenticity issues with Avebury 2008? Not at all. In fact, in my film, I wanted to be very careful not to include uh, ones that were considered um, controversial. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I took one out that for uh, was for a long time considered one of the gems of the crop circle world. And then I discovered there was no question about it being hoax. It was that spider web outside of Avebury. Mm -hmm that came in in two nights, uh, one, one the web and then the spokes in another night. And the community was by and large in awe of that. And but also because it came in in two nights, like, oh, something new came in in two nights. Oh, how fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then just not all that long ago, the people who were responsible for it came forward or were revealed or some such. I had it in my movie. I took it out. I didn't want to put anything in my film that had bore that kind of questionable stamp and I've got that 2012 one in there because nobody's saying anything about that one that uh, questions its authenticity. In her documentary, Suzanne uses some images from the Crop Circle Connector website, just as I did. And that's part of her explanations. So let's listen to what she said. In July of 2008, the circle makers pointed us at 2012. They gave us a formation which shows the orbital relationships of the planets in our solar system in December of that year. At that time, the Mayan calendar ends and something momentous has been foretold to occur. This now brings us full circle back to a point made earlier in the program that if the predictions contained within the Avebury 2008 formation come to pass, that we'll be seeing what appears to be two suns in the sky on December 21, 2012. Likewise, we also know that we've never been alone, never have been, never shall be, that we have friends out there, and that we may have enemies as well. So let's focus on that third part for a moment, because if the prediction in the Avebury 2008 formation is speaking to us about Planet X, or Nibiru as it is commonly known, we must ask a simple question. Is there a connection between Nibiru and the Anunnaki? And if so, what does that mean to us? The first time I asked myself this question was in 2002. At the time, there were a large number of people expecting a flyby of Planet X in the summer of 2003. However, in 2002, those of us on the Yauza.com research team did not see any physical evidence to support that claim, and we reported this on our website. Apparently our articles caught the attention of Zachariah Sitchin and he obtained my telephone number through a mutual friend and called me on a Sunday morning, somewhat early, and offered to give us an exclusive interview. I was honored by the call and of course, I accepted. 
The ancient Sumerian accounts of Nibiru were translated by Zachariah Sitchin into a series of books. His first, The Twelfth Planet, was first published in 1976 and remains a worldwide favorite and has been translated into numerous languages. This is because he makes a strong case for the existence of Nibiru. In June 2002, we published our interview with Sitchin and likewise maintained our standing view that we saw no basis for a Planet X flyby in 2003, which in fact did not happen. This is not to say that the 2003 non-event changed our opinion about Nibiru, or Planet X if you will. It didn't change a thing. Not for us, nor for Sitchin. Sitchin maintained its existence up until the day he died, and I still continue to maintain that it does exist. So with that in mind, let's ask the poignant question. What is Sitchin telling us? According to his translations of the ancient Sumerian texts, extraterrestrials called the Anunnaki are responsible for the missing link in human evolution. In other words, we Homo sapiens are a genetically engineered hybrid slave species. Let's be honest. Given that we live in a genetically modified world, how shocking can this idea really be? Well, if you're a theological fundamentalist, what Sitchin has to say is pretty shocking. And it's probably something you're not going to want to listen to or let anyone else listen to. But let's take that and set it aside. Let's focus on something else that's more relevant to what's happening in the present. That being what Zachariah Sitchin had to say about the Anunnaki and what that could mean for us as a potential future threat. This is because we Homo sapiens were created as a slave race principally to mine gold, through a combination of Anunnaki and native human genes. And yes, it reads like a page straight out of a John Carter of Mars novel. No question about it. We proved to be very good gold miners, and to top that off, the Anunnaki took quite a liking to earth women as well. So. How far-fetched are Sitchin's ideas? To be honest, I hadn't given it that much thought until I was seeing who was attacking Sitchin's work. And there's just primarily two types of attackers. Theological fundamentalists who are shocked by his notions and want to quash it any way possible, truth be damned. And then the others are hack writers that are looking for a little mileage, if you will, for their own published efforts on the backs of a man who passed away in 2010. So please, if there is some serious competition out there, I'd love to see it. Because after working closely with Zachariah Sitchin on that 2002 article, what I can say about the men is that he dotted his I's and crossed his T's with fastidious detail. But then there is the Anunnaki issue. If they do come back, what does history teach us to expect? Or more specifically, what could be the worst case scenario? It will undoubtedly start with cosmic shock and awe. Then, while we're busy picking our jaws up off the ground, the Anunnaki will be snatching up all the gold and young virgins they want. When they've had their fill, they'll bug out before the worst of the solar storms hit. And by then, we'll be too busy running for cover to say thanks for dropping by. As to the gold, let them have it. As to the women, Abduction is where we need to draw the line, not as men, but as a united species. That being said, the most relevant thing about the Anunnaki to this conversation 
is the Anunnaki symbol itself and how it, well, you could say, got me going on decoding a very 2008, but in a very, very strange way. It appeared in the fields of Avebury in 2010, an authentic crop circle formation showing the ancient Sumerian winged disc symbol for Nibiru and the Anunnaki. This winged symbol is a recurring theme in ancient folklore. This, in and of itself, is quite interesting. However, what really caught my attention was where the formation appeared in the fields of Avebury, and just a short distance from the field in which the Avebury 2008 formation had first appeared. At that time, I viewed the locations of these two very different formations in Avebury as being coincidental. That was until I started to Google the 2010 formation. What I found surprised me. All of the top search engine links for this Anunnaki symbol formation were being redirected to a completely unrelated commentary page on the Crop Circle Connector site. On that completely unrelated commentary page, the Avebury 2010 formation was declared a hoax. This was not a prankster. This had all the hallmarks of a paid cover-up. So I contacted Mark Fusel and Stuart Dyke of the Crop Circle Connector website, laid out all the details for them. They were surprised. And so they presented my comments to the folks that were calling this formation a hoax on a pure redirect to an unrelated page. The response was nothing other than we were called a lot of names and these other folks just sulked off. It was obvious. It was a disinformation ploy, and we had blown the operation. In the process, I learned valuable lessons about disinformation tactics, which in turn led me to a vital turning point in my analysis of the Yabberry 2008 formation. Prior to learning about this disinformation tactic I'd spotted with the 2010 formation, we'd mostly wasted the previous 18 months on a rather unfruitful analysis of the Avebury 2008 formation. Relying on a study group with an ever-changing mix of researchers, we tended to try and compare our results with those published on the Crop Circle Connector site and elsewhere. It was a given. The problem was, when we did that, nothing added up to our own satisfaction. Now I understood why our study group was so stymied. We were being led down rabbit holes by some rather artful disinformationalists. But as they say, every dark cloud has a silver lining, and this one reminded me of a popular saying during the Watergate scandal that forced the resignation of then President Richard Nixon. It's not the crime, it's the cover-up. As a result, I learned a really big lesson, and this helped me to, well, put the wheels back on the wagon, so to speak. Now I knew what I had to do and where I had to start doing it. That being to start over, beginning with a simple spot, as it's called, a single point of truth. Find the spot, and the dots will always connect. I first began by reviewing my group's creative analysis, and excluded the comparative analysis that always seemed to cause us so much trouble. Doing that, I quickly found my spot. A Canadian engineer by the name of Richard St. Laurent had identified the legend in late 2009. A legend explains the pictorial language of the map. It gives us a sense of how to interpret what we're looking at in combination with other elements of the map. In terms of the complete formation, the star map legend Richard found was off to the side, as most legends are, and it appeared with the second part of the formation, first reported on July 22, 2008 
And in late 2009, Richard had identified the legend as this small elliptical glyph. At that point, what I and my Avebury 2008 analysis group had been incapable of achieving in the previous 18 months now came all together for me in less than 18 hours, and the dots connected perfectly. That being said, the discussion of this formation only takes up the first third of my book, Crossing the Cusp, Surviving the Edgar Cayce Pole Shift. What I do in the remaining two-thirds of the book is to focus on ways to survive what I believe could be the single greatest dieback event in the history of our species, a pole shift as predicted by the sleeping prophet Edgar Cayce. But how could it happen? If Edgar Cayce's pole shift prediction comes true, I believe it'll be primarily a solar-driven event. It's rather simple. Imagine the sun as a stovetop, and Earth is the tea kettle. An onslaught of energy from violent solar storms begin pounding the Earth without mercy, which in turn sets things to boil, so to speak. So. What could that cause? One example is the violent earthquake that drove a devastating tsunami into northern Japan on March 11, 2011. According to NASA, it shortened the length of Earth's days and shifted its axis. Granted, by just a smidgen, but nonetheless, it happened, which begs the question, what would be the consequences of a rapid-fire succession of violent earthquakes like the Japan quake? On a global basis, how many such quakes would it take in rapid succession to generate a shift in the Earth's axis in the manner predicted by Edgar Cayce? Yes, this is a dark question, but one that forces clarity into the conversation. That being, do we just sit here and take it, or is there something else we can do? Yes, there is something else we certainly can do. If this prediction comes to pass, we cannot hope to avoid what's coming, but we can dramatically mitigate it. In other words, it doesn't have to be as bad as it could be thanks to something I call an intention vortex. In my book, Crossing the Cusp, Surviving the Edgar Cayce Pole Shift, I describe a global event called an intention vortex, the goal of which is to slightly alter the orbit of a small unstable moon or satellite in orbit around a larger object, such as Planet X, the result being a more survivable flyby event. To make it work will require a global cooperation between scientists, spiritualists, media and computer networking specialists using present-day technologies. Physicists will tell you an intention vortex is possible, though they hasten to add it would be a theoretical long shot. But on the other hand, if our backs are up against the wall, we have everything to gain and nothing to lose. This is why I wrote this chapter much like a pro forma business plan, including a global topology of who is doing what, why, where, when, and how. This is because for the first time in our species, we do possess the talent and technologies necessary for such a bold effort. And this brings us full circle to a point I made at the beginning of this program, that the first rule of predictions must be, always be mindful of them, but never live in expectation of them. With regards to the Avebury 2008 formation, this does not mean you do not have to prepare. It means prepare in a cool-headed manner. So what if it turns out that the two suns in the sky prediction of the Avebury 2008 formation never happens? Well then, I'll have the sincere pleasure of hearing the world laugh at my expense, 
because this is one prediction that no sane person would ever want to see come to pass. On the other hand, if this prediction does come to pass, and we do see what appears to be two suns in the sky on December 21, 2012, those who are prepared will see it with a profound sense of sadness. Conversely, those who are not prepared will experience a fearful sense of doom. And this brings us down to what December 21, 2012 is really all about. In a word, choice. And to that I say, may each and every one of us choose wisely. And I'll leave it on that note. So until the next time we meet, remember Marshall's motto, destiny comes to those who listen and fate finds the rest. So learn what you can learn, do what you can do, and never give up hope. This is Marshall, and I'll catch you on the backside.